The title for this morning's message is Be Transformed. And the text comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So let's read those verses. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right, we just got back from late last night from the men's retreat. And the theme of our men's retreat this weekend was God's will, question mark. What is God's will? How do we know God's will? Well, as we were doing some of the teachings, our first session, Matt, he covered things that were clearly stated in Scripture. Right? There are t things clearly stated in Scripture as this is the will of God. Your sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4.3. How about rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 and 18. Clearly spelled out. Henry, yesterday morning, he said, you know, sometimes we have to draw on the, the whole of God's word. Because there are things that are not clearly spelled out. Decisions, right? But does there, is there anything in here that says, this is what you do when accepting a new job, or if you're looking, should I take, right? Some of those things are not clearly spelled out in Scripture. But God's Word is clear. So we talked about the Word. The Word is our source. The Word is where we get wisdom then. And we looked at Proverbs chapter 3. So if you guys want to read that on your own, we looked at Proverbs chapter 3. So the Word to wisdom, and then it leads to discernment. Right? Choosing what's right and wrong. Doing what God wants us to do. So as we come to our text today, our text tells us what to do. Paul says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he tells you what not to do. Do not be conformed to this world. And then he follows that up by telling you again what to do. Right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why would he say this? If you have an NIV, I like the way they render the last part of verse 2. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You do these things, he's saying, then you're going to be able to test. You're going to be able to prove and approve what is God's will. And then by obeying what Paul says here, we actually then will walk worthy of our calling, what we've been studying through Ephesians. So as we go through the text today, there's three main parts I want to look at. Three things Paul's really telling us to do as believers. And the first is, give God your body. Give God your mind. And finally, give God your will. So give God your body, your mind, your will. So let's look at that first part. Give God your body in verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. See, this one verse is so densely packed that it requires us to really pull it apart and look at each phrase individually. And I think as we do that, this passage then is going to kind of reward us in the fact that we see one treasure after another in the text. So the first thing Paul says is, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So he addresses the brethren. Who are the brethren? brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, by the mercies of God. If you think about it, why can we call ourselves the brethren? It's because of the mercy of God. The mercy of God. So Paul is saying, by these mercies, by the mercies of God. 
It says in Lamentations that his love never ceases. So God's love never ceases. His mercies never end. And guess what? They are new every morning. So Paul says, by these mercies of God, I am beseeching you. I am begging you to listen. And that word, therefore, what that does is links to the chapters that went before. Namely, Paul's been teaching through Romans regarding God's grace and our faith. But I think what Paul is doing here is he's putting a bookend, if you will, on what he said way back in the beginning of Romans chapter 6. So turn to Romans chapter 6. Because at the beginning of Romans chapter 6, Paul dispels the notion that all we need is faith and grace. So he says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, what Paul's saying is, there were those who were saying, well, if grace is so good, and we want God's grace, then why don't we go continue to sin so we get more grace? Kind of, Human logic, right? So what is Paul saying? Is certainly not. We cannot say that. Because how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? We're no longer to live in it because we've died to it. See, one commentator had said that Paul does not know or or also has never approved of a justification that does not introduce and lead to a life of righteousness. Right? Sanctification is the process of us becoming more righteous. But he didn't, Paul never said, well, you know what? All you got to be is justified and just wait and ride out your ticket to heaven. Does he ever say that? No, he says, now, because you are a Christian, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to act. So what Paul is saying is, I beseech you therefore. It's a big long therefore. And then what he does here is he's going to emphasize that our faith needs to bring forth holy lives, set apart lives. And that faith is carried out in faithfulness. See, faith and faithfulness are forever linked. So what Paul does now is he's going to offer practical counsel regarding faithful discipleship. So he says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Some of your translations, instead of acceptable, say well-pleasing to God. And the Greek word used for body here is the word soma, which literally means a physical mortal flesh. But as Paul uses it in his epistle, soma is not something external to the person. But it is rather one aspect of the person. Why is it one aspect of the person? Because he believes, and all all the Jewish believed, that the soul, right, the spirit, and the body are one. And they are not separate, they are one. And we as Christians live in a body with the Spirit. But they are one. So what he's trying to tell us is that they are united, body and spirit. That's why he says in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. The body should not be separate from the will. See, in his view, there is nothing incompatible with the body and the spirit because both are important to how we live our lives as Christians. Both are to be sacred, body and spirit. Both are essential to human life. You need a body, 
But you also need the Spirit. When you think about it, that's what Christian discipleship is about. How do we act out? How do we perform what the Spirit is telling us to do? It's through our bodies. See, the understanding that Paul had, that Christians have, at that time was radically different from what the culture of that time had. Because the culture at that time was influenced by a philosophy of Plato called dualism. See, dualism separated the world into the visible, or the physical, or the material, and the invisible, or the spiritual. So the dualist said, really, this body is just something that has to be endured, and life is something that has to be endured until we die, and then we can free our spirit. This just has to be endured. So just get through it. Well, then there was also another form at that time called Gnosticism. It kind of took dualism to the extreme. And what Gnosticism says was that all matter, including flesh, all matter is evil, all spirit is good. So what they were saying is the spirit cannot live in a man. So they are the ones who denied the deity of Christ. There's no way a God could come in flesh as a man because flesh is evil. But what Paul is saying here is so different, radically different. He's saying, present your bodies, your flesh, as a living sacrifice. Well, a living sacrifice kind of goes against what the Torah says because what happens to the sacrifices in the Old Testament, they don't live, do they? They die. Sacrifice was given to die. Even Christ sacrificed, but he died, but he rose again. But what he's telling us is, and the Christians in Rome, that we are to offer our lives as a living sacrifice. See, Christians are not to substitute an animal's life for their own, Paul's saying, but we are instead required to sacrifice our very own lives. The lives that we live are to be sacrificed for him. If you could, find your way to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 24 through 26. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So Paul now is echoing those words of Jesus. If you are a brother, a brethren, brother and sister in Christ, he's saying, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Pick up your cross. Say, Lord, here I am, all of me, I'm yours. See, so we're to be a living sacrifice. And what that means is now we have a life that's dedicated to the service of God. A life that's committed to doing God's will. A life that's lived in faith and lived out in faithfulness. See, we're, we are not only to present our bodies for God's purpose on Sundays for worship, right? People think about that. That's not the only time we're to be presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. 
but also we're to do it on Monday when we go into the workplace. We're to do it in, home, in our homes. We're to do it when we're out in public. Basically what Paul is saying is offer your bodies as a living sacrifice every day and at all times. And Paul declares that this living self-sacrifice is holy. It's set apart. It's acceptable. It's well-pleasing to God. See, it's what God desires, he's saying, is for us to do this. Because the person who truly does this, God is rejoicing. Because we are obedient. See, now Paul, and he's telling the Roman Christians and us that it is their lives that are required. It's your very life, your very body, everything you do physically, he's saying, is required. And that's to be offered as living sacrifices. See, these sacrifices are holy and pleasing to God, even as those animal sacrifices, when they were offered in the right spirit, were pleasing to God. They were holy. They were acceptable. Living sacrifices are holy in that they represent lives lived in accord with the will of God, set apart to do His will. Paul then says that offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, you may say, well, why would I offer my body as a living sacrifice? Why should I? Well, Paul, being the consummate man to answer arguments of people, says, it's your reasonable service. I like what other translations say. If you have the ESV, I love what it renders right there. It is your spiritual worship. To offer your bodies a living sacrifice is your spiritual worship. See that word used for reasonable there is the Greek word logikin. Guess what word we get from that? Logic. Logical. See that word logikin has a variety of meanings. It can be translated as you see reasonable, spiritual, can all, it's also translated as logical, rational, genuine, or true. It's got a breadth of meanings. I think Paul chose it for that reason because it is, it covers such a broad meaning. See, to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices is indeed a spiritual act. It is a surrendering of your will. See, to live lives dedicated to God's service is genuine worship. It's pure worship. And one of the things Paul is saying here, because he says, brethren, right, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He says, which is your reasonable service? So what he's really saying here is that the logical outcome of a life committed to Christ is giving God your body. That's what he's saying. Right? Giving God your body. So now he goes on to say, now you need to give God your mind. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see that command, and do not be conformed to this world. Conformity. Conformity, I think, is a concept that we have to be familiar with. Really, not just to understand what Paul's saying here, because this word plays a very important role in our lives and in our society today. In a world that says, Conform. 
conform to me. Different groups calling out, conform, conform. What is the word, what does conformity mean? It means to conform to another's pattern. To, to change and to conform to that pattern. Think of a pattern, right? Any sewers in here? You've got to cut out patterns. I don't know if people do that anymore. Or you just go to the store and buy it because it's cheaper. <laughs> but you know, in the old days, right, you have a pattern you'd cut out. And what do you do to the, you put that pattern on top of the, right, on top of the, what do you call that stuff? Fabric, there you go. I call it clothes because that's all I ever have. But. but you put it on that fabric and what do you do? You take a scissors, you cut around it, and now guess what? That fabric's now conformed to that pattern. So what he's saying here is Christian. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do not allow yourself to be trimmed and conformed to the world. Do not let the world shape you. See, the word conformity here actually has the meaning of malleability. Malleable. Think of putty or clay. You can form it. So Paul is saying, do not let the world, or literal translation, this age, this present age, do not let it conform you. Do not let it shape you. Do not allow yourself to be shaped by it. See, don't allow the world to tell you what to do, what to say, what to wear, what car you should drive. What, what, what? We live in a society that is telling people, conform, conform, conform. When you think about even ads on TV, what's an ad on TV, any ad? What are they trying to do? They're trying to, get, they're trying to shape you? so that you buy their product. How does the world try to shape people? They try to shape you by saying, you know what, the Bible may not be true. Does God really exist? Why are you really here? Why are we really here? We've got the answer. We'll make you feel accepted. We've got the answers. See, there's tremendous pressure to conform to the standards of a group. And it's not just the majority. Now, in our society, it's the minority that's trying to get people to conform. You might be thinking, well, that's a problem for our kids. Good thing they're in there learning about that. No, it's a problem for adults, too. I mean, the pressure to conform is the strongest during adolescence, during young adulthood. That's when it's the strongest because kids are trying to figure out who they are, why they're here, all those questions. They're trying to find their place in this world. But human nature is people desperately want to be accepted and esteemed by others. It's part of human nature, and it's part of what draws the people to the world. There's a danger in conformity to the world. It can easily lead to us doing things we know are wrong. Conformity to me starts with compromise. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. Temptation comes and we say, yeah, okay, one little thing's not going to hurt. One little time of doing that is not going to hurt. See, the pressure, like I said, to conform is great. I mean, there's peer pressure. There's, like I said, the media. There's movies. There's music. We're inundated with the call to conform to this world. And the danger is once we give in, it gets easier to give in. It gets easier and easier. And the next thing we know, we look like that pattern. 
We allow ourselves. See, that's the thing that Christian, when they are conformed to this world, is because they chose to be. They chose to be conformed. That's why he says, and do not be conformed. Make the choice not to be conformed. One commentator said, being conformed to this world is like being a leaf blown by the wind, never knowing exactly where you are going next or why you are going there. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. What John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 is that conformity to the things of this world separate us from God. If we conform to the things of this world, it separates us from God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... What is in the world? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. What John is saying here is, you know what's all in the world? It sums it up in three things. It's the lust of the flesh, satisfaction of the flesh, sexual immorality, satisfying sexual desires. It says, that's the world. And then he says, the lust of the eyes, succumbing to lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes covers a lot. Basically, it's all covetousness. It's covetousness that then leads to other more serious sins. But it's the lust of the eyes. And finally, what is the third thing? It just basically sums up all man right there. Pride. The pride of life. Prideful. I matter. What I do matters. What I've achieved matters. Everything matters. My life matters. But what did Jesus say? If you want to save your life, you need to lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And he says, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. To this age. It's for the Christian that happens, and Paul addressed it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, when he told the Ephesian church to no longer be children. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Right? He says, we're, we're to get grounded, we're to know the word, we're to be steadfast so that we are not thrown all over the place because, guess what? Men are deceitful. And he says, you need to know the truth so you do not get tossed to and fro. So he says, do not be conformed to this world in, chap- in chapter 12, verse 2, but... But what? If you're not to do that, what are you to do? You're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that word that is translated transformed in the Greek is totally different from conformity. It actually involves a transformation at the core of one's being. So if being conformed would leave us adrift like a leaf, Being transformed leaves us with feet on the ground. We're anchored and we're steady. So Paul is calling us to 
not be caught up in every fad or wafted by every breeze of doctrine, but instead to let the Holy Spirit transform us right down to our core of who we are so that we can then have a faith strong enough to maintain our course in spite of all the storms going on around us or the winds trying to push us off course. We are steadfast. And that word transformed, in the Greek it's metamorphosis. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's a change. I mean, if you think of a caterpillar going through metamorphosis, right? It's a caterpillar, and then it comes out as a beautiful butterfly. It's changed its appearance. It's beautiful. Think about that as we are transforming our lives by the renewing of our minds. We're like caterpillars, but now we're getting changed. We're getting transformed and into the image of Christ. We're getting transformed. We're becoming beautiful, more righteous, getting sanctified. See, this is referring to us renewing our minds so that we can be transformed. It's got to come in the mind so that the heart can be changed. See, godly thoughts transform every aspect of our being. And we actually have an example in the Old Testament of a man. His name's Ezra. See, Ezra was the priest that that led the second wave of Jews back to Jerusalem from Babylon after their captivity. And we're told in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. See, Ezra was a man who took the word of God seriously. And hopefully he'll serve as an example for all of us. See, next to our prayer life, there's nothing as important to the Christian as Bible reading and personal study, being in the word. Because by reading and studying the Bible, we learn what to believe. We learn what we were created to be. We learn how to act. We learn how to live with comfort and peace. And as one old commentator said, eventually, we will die in peace. Because the word has settled our souls. What an awesome picture. That it will settle you all the way to the end. And I love the way the New American Standard renders Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. It says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. See the law of the word, Lord there, that word law, Torah, the teachings of the Lord. So don't just think it's the first five, it's the teachings. So all the teachings, we have more teachings than Ezra had, but all the teachings. So he set his heart to study the teachings of the Lord and to practice it and to teach the Lord's statutes and ordinances in Israel. See that word set here in the New American Standard, or you have a New King James that's prepared, or a couple of other translations have the word devoted. So he set his heart, prepared his heart, devoted his heart. The word for heart there is the Hebrew word kun. Or for set, sorry, is kun. And it's a verb. It means action. It means to be fixed on or to be securely determined to do. So he was determined to study the law of the Lord. See, this action of setting your heart, to set your heart, we talked about it at the retreat last night, it requires us 
to have desire and pursuit in align with the will of God. See, there can be no division between that desire and the pursuit to study God's Word. Because if you desire, and desiring God's Word is all you have, and you do not pursue the Word, you're not going to obtain it. You know why? Because you didn't do anything. You just wished. But on the flip side, you can pursue all you want. And you can be legalistic in your pursuit and say, I will set aside, I will read a chapter every day, I will be in that word every day. Because I have to. If you have no desire to be in that word, that desire to learn that word, so you're pursuing and you don't have the desire, you're not going to obtain the results you want either. Because guess what? When the first sign of adversity comes, you're going to say, yeah, it's not working. That's enough. You have to have desire and pursuit. You're gonna, you need to want to be in God's Word. And you have to be in God's Word. So that word set, desire and pursuit. And notice he set his heart. Heart there, the Hebrew word is labad. It means the very center of your being, the seat of the will. He set that all within me. With all that is within me, he says, ah, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to study. The law of the Lord. And notice the order here. Study with practice, then teach. Study, practice, teach. See, studying the Bible. See, there's many that will tell you that the Bible is just a bunch of stories written by a bunch of fallible men and it's nothing more than a fairy tale. Right? Isn't that the world's going to tell you? But what are you going to say as a Christian? What are you going to use to back up and say, no, it's not? Well, hopefully you use 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love the way the NIV renders it. It says all Scripture is God-breathed. It's the very breath of God. And just as the breath of God gave life to Adam, His Word gives life to our souls. See, God, it's inspired by God. It's God's breath. It's His Word. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Right there, God is saying, Okay, man, human, you don't even come close to my thoughts. Your best thought isn't even close to my thoughts. So whose thoughts are we going to trust on? Right? Whose words are we going to lean on for understanding? See, if we truly believe the Bible then we need to believe this truth that all Scripture is inspired by God. And what is the main goal then as we come to read the Word and as we study the Word? What's the main goal? Check it off the list because you got it done that day? Or Pastor Kevin said I need to start doing it so I'm going to do it? See, as you study the Bible... You're not just learning rules and regulations, history, right? The do's and the don'ts. You're not just learning history. You're not just learning some facts and figures. How much is an ephod? <laughs> right? You're not just learning stuff like that. 
You're getting to know the awesome character of the one who's responsible for the words you're reading. God himself. You're getting to know the one who created you. You're getting to know the one who sent his one and only son to die for your sins. See, the goal is getting to know the God of the Word. Because His thoughts are not our thoughts. So how do we start doing this? Well, first we start reading daily. Carrie pointed something out at the men's retreat. He says, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes is only 1% of your day. 1% of your day is 15 minutes. Kind of got me thinking, can we just give God 1% of our day? Can you imagine how our lives could change if we gave Him just 1%? We should give Him a lot more than that. Amen? But if we just gave Him that 1%, how much would our lives change? Right? Start. Read. And pray what you read. Meditate on what you read. Set aside time to dig deeper. See, studying the Bible allows us to know our God more fully. And in doing so, it also allows us to know who we really are. But in order to find out who we truly are, we have to find out who He truly is. in reading the Bible, studying the Word, it helps us to fall more in love with our God. We fall more in love with Him. So Ezra. Ezra set his heart to study the Word of God. I pray that we too would set our heart to study the Word of God. Or like Paul says here, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we do that? Setting our heart to study the Word of God. But that doesn't stop there. We learn, we study, now we have to put it into action. And that's what Paul calls us to do next, to give our will to God. Verse 2, he says, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. J.C. Ryle, an old commentator, said, happy is the man who possesses his Bible. Right? So happy is the man who possesses a Bible. Happier still is he who reads it. (laughs) Right? But he says, you know what? Happiest of all is he who not only reads it, but obeys it and makes it the rule of his faith and practice. These, these, old, these old Puritan guys, they knew it, right? It's not enough just to have a copy. They said, you know, you're happy. If it's, good, it's a good thing if you got a copy, but it's better if you read it. <laughs> but you know what's even better than reading it? Applying what you've read. Taking what you read and make it your daily pattern of life. See, if we, are to discern God's will, if we are to discern God's will, it's going to have to be by not trying to remake God into our own image or by having God conform to our presuppositions, our thoughts. We would say by not fitting God into our theological box. If we're going to discern God's will, We have to do it by allowing the Holy Spirit to renew our thinking based off of God's Word. To say, this is the standard. I know I thought this, but God says this, so it must be, it is, because God said it. Right, so we study the Word by renewing the mind. We practice them. We do the Word. In 2 Timothy 3.16, 
right? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what we know, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Those are actions. See, doctrine, right? What we know from the word, what we learn from the word first is our doctrine, our beliefs. But then out of our doctrine comes action. But then we have to have these other three things, reproof, correction, instruction. See, there's input in our daily lives and there's output in our lives. We constantly have to analyze the input and the output. Is the output lining up with what the Word says? Right? That's reproofing. You're testing it. Guess what happens when it doesn't? You go and you correct it. Because as we correct and as we live to be more Christ-like, we grow in righteousness. It's a cycle that we continue to do. So like I said, the Word is our standard. The Word is what drives our actions because it is the will of God. It's His words. And like Pam was saying earlier, there is a clash of worldviews taking place. There always has been. Right? A worldview is literally how you view the world. And it does. It answers those questions. Who am I? If you want to know somebody's worldview, ask them three questions. Who am I? Who are you? Why are you here? And where are you going? You ask those three questions, and they'll tell you their worldview. We as Christians need to know who we are. Why are we here? Where are we going? What is the hope that you have as a Christian? We need to use the Word as our standard to determine the truth. That's why we always talk about Christians having a biblical worldview. The way we view the world, the way we answer these questions is predicated upon how Scripture tells us to answer these questions. See, God's Word is holy and it's true. See, one of the cries of the Reformation, so they had seven cries, seven solas they called them. The seven solas of the Reformation. One of them was sola scriptura, which means by Scripture alone. See, what they were saying is that Scripture alone must be the standard by which all questions of doctrine and how to live the Christian life would be tested. By Scripture alone. What they were saying is the Word of God will become our filter. The Word of God will then tell us how to test, how to prove what the will of God is. To see, am I being transformed or am I being a conformist to the world? The Word of God will tell you when you measure it against it. See, reprove, test, correct. And what that does then as a Christian is it helps us overcome temptation and the devil's traps. Because we know what God says to do. We know that God is faithful. We know that God will forgive. And as we live and we go through that cycle, right? we get the Word, we do the Word, oops, I messed up. Because guess what? You're going to mess up. You're going to sin. Then what do you do? Go to God, seek forgiveness, correct that action, and do it again. That's why I like that word practice in the New American Standard. Right? Think of like teams, sports teams. They have games, but what do they do before those games? They practice, they practice. They correct their actions. Our big game, our game's not going to happen until we get to heaven. 
So guess what we're doing here? We're practicing. We're going to try to do it right. But there's going to be times we don't. And God is faithful and just to forgive when we don't. And the good thing about God is He wipes the slate clean. He says, all right, now do it again. <laughs> right? All right. Take another shot at it. We don't have a God who says, you made a mistake, get out of my life. Get out. He's there. So when we give God our will, we're like that man in 2 Timothy 3.17, a man of God, complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And we give God our will. So by living a holy, set-apart life, we show or we prove that God's will is good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. See, now that we're doing what we've learned, that's when we then are able to teach others. We teach first and foremost by our lives. If we're walking the will of God, people will see the will of God, and we're teaching then. We teach by what we do. We also teach by sharing what we've learned, sharing the gospel with others. I mean, my prayer is the same as Paul's words, right? That we would be people who would present our bodies, right? Give God your body. And that we would not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. So give God your mind. And that we would prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So give God your will. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these words. And I pray that as we, we go forth today, that we would be a people that would be hungry. Hungry for your word that we would be like Ezra and set our hearts, be determined in our hearts that we have that desire and that we pursue Your Word, that we study it, that we know what it says, and then that we would live it, or that we would do Your will. Lord, change us. Change us from the inside, Lord. We love you. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.